do actually have a special guest today, but we're going to do something a little bit special today before we start getting too involved in this show. This is a weekly broadcast, an alternative to the IFPI, the RIA, the NBA, Netflix, and Gormley here in Saskatchewan. And today is a special day because there's a lot of fear and a lot of panic and a lot of freaking out going on in the world, perhaps in Saskatchewan, in California, and elsewhere. And so I just want to try something a little bit different today. You may have noticed a couple of episodes ago, there was a meditation. There was a blank 30 minutes of silence as you could follow along or do your own thing for the 30 minutes that we had together. But today we're gonna try something a little bit more uh, direct, a little bit more guided, a little bit more intentional. So if you are hearing this broadcast, if you are listening to this and you're not doing anything important, if you're doing something important, obviously keep doing it and maybe just listen along or maybe change the channel to something else. But if you aren't doing anything important and you've got five minutes to kill, what I'd like you to do is to try to find a comfortable place on the ground that you can sit. Uh, this is best if you have like a pillow or something to sit on. Uh, nothing too comfortable, but nothing too uncomfortable. So if you're going to sit on some raw concrete on your bare feet and your bare legs or something like that, obviously don't sit there. But if you can find somewhere where you can just relax and sit and get comfortable, the important part is to get comfortable. And so if you can just find that place to sit, I'm going to give you about 30 seconds to find that place, and then we're going to continue. I'm just going to see if I can get a timer here. So we're just going to wait, and you're going to find a place to sit. We're all going to just sit together, all of us who are listening, all of us who are watching. We're going to find a place to sit. And so hopefully now you've found that place, and you've gotten yourself seated. And the way to sit, there's a lot of ways to sit, and if you have a way that is comfortable for you, by all means, sit in that way. Personally, I sit in something kind of like a lotus position where I fold my legs under myself. The important part, though, is to be balanced and comfortable so that you could sit like this if you had to for 30 minutes or more. So if you can sit and have your legs be comfortable, you want to be symmetric as possible so that you don't have too much weight on one side. And if you can rest your hands in a comfortable place, perhaps in front of you somewhere, that would be ideal. And sit with your back straight, your chin up, and just relax. And what we're going to do is all together, I'd like you all to take a deep breath and breathe in as deep as you can and then out. And I want you all, everyone who is now listening and hopefully relaxing together, to slowly close your eyes.
and breathe in. And out. And to keep breathing. And as you're breathing in and out, to notice what it feels like to breathe. To pay attention of what your chest is doing, how your belly is moving, how it feels, how your clothing feels, perhaps. Everything about your breathing and the movement. Is the air around you cold when you breathe it in? Is the air warm when you breathe it out? And we're just trying to think about what it feels like to breathe. And if you find yourself thinking about other things, that's okay. We're just going to try to stop that line of thought and to focus on your breathing and the breath as it comes in. And as it leaves your body, we're just going to keep breathing, keep following that breath as it moves in and out of your lungs. So the whole of your body moves with it. As the feelings of stress and worry leave your body with it, little by little. If you're still worried, you're still scared or stressed. That's okay. But what we want to focus on is the breath. And it's what your body is doing, what your lungs are capable of, when they bring oxygen into your bloodstream when you breathe. Oxygen gives you life two minutes at a time. It's a powerful thing to breathe. And you are breathing right now. And if you find that you begin to be a little uncomfortable, Maybe you're sitting a little too heavily on one foot. See if you can just feel that uncomfortableness. But then go back and feel what it feels like to be breathing. To redirect your attention for the moment. Back to the air coming in. And out. You'll be able to move. The rest of the world will be there when you open your eyes. It's okay. We're just going to try to keep with our breath. And we're going to count from three, breathing in, and 
a note. The two. To one. And then we're going to open our eyes all together and get up and stretch if you want to or uncomfortable. Now, continue on with our show. So, today, as I mentioned, I do have a special guest. Anne, are you still there? Uh, yeah, actually, I, I kind of sat down and did the meditation instead of uh, <laughs> wandering around looking for shit. So that was very nice. Cool. I'm, I'm glad you enjoyed that as well. I was, I was wondering how well that would work, but it seems like we... Uh, Thank you. Did okay there. So I'm just going to see if I can get a little bit louder here. Hold on for a moment. Uh, once I get out of this crappy-ass building, which we may or may not wind up going into why I'm in this crappy-ass building. Uh, but as soon as I get out of this crappy-ass building, the uh, reception I'm getting on this phone should improve. Awesome. So I've got the two microphones a little bit better positioned here. So the first thing I, we kind of talked a little bit before we started here that I wanted to get into before we get too far into other topics is I encountered maybe a, a couple of people this week who started referring to the uh, trending topics on Twitter. And on the way that Twitter works is you have these hashtags, uh, which are you get like a pound or an uh, octothorpe sign and then a word, and then people can either search to see using those words, uh, which are usually clickable as hyperlinks, everyone in the world, who, at least on Twitter, is talking about a particular word or combination of words. And then one of the things that Twitter does, as I'm sure you're aware, is then uh, purports to have the most popular of these hashtags in its list of trending uh, hashtags. So it's kind of a way for people to look at and see, oh, what's going on in the world? What are the, the popular words or the popular hashtags uh, that are being used right now today? But of course, the problem is that this is a known to be manipulated thing. We know that Twitter, the company, does not treat this as a neutral playground where the whole world can basically decide in something of a democratic way what is seen and what is not seen. There are things that become talked about in a large way, but there are other things that are not. And, and so if you trust the Twitter hashtags and the, the trending topics to be the thing that is popular, you get a very distorted and biased view. So have you, have you seen any examples of this? Or uh, what is your take on this? Um, I don't pay enough attention to Twitter to really get my underwear in a bundle over this, but I have noticed that sometimes if I type in a, a hashtag that might be somewhat controversial, even if it seems to be trending, autofill won't complete it, which seems a little fishy. My experience with Twitter manipulating the hashtags is limited, but as you were talking, I was just thinking, wow, it's really funny how far we've come since George Orwell, you know? It used to be just the government that was in the business of sense but now we, you know, the government doesn't even need to bother spending money censoring us. We have uh, private corporations acting like a government for free. Exactly. And so there's a little bit of choice that we get with that, of course, because, I mean, not everyone has to use Twitter, of course. Well, there's, yeah, there's you different... can use Gab and be in kind of a, another kind of echo bubble where, you know, you get literally fake news like, the entire coronavirus outbreak in, in Italy was started by a Pakistani delivery guy who wouldn't self-quarantine. Uh, you know, you, I, 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 got, I got a digest from Gab the other day, and I was like, oh, really? This is our, our, our only alternative to Twitter? Yeah. I mean, <laughs> I mean, aside from the fact that, like, you would want to fact-check a story like that, you almost don't need to fact-check it because how on earth would someone be asked to self-quarantine in Italy at the height of the COVID-19 outbreak. Well, th this is actually kind of a good point because I think at some point people are going to start taking for granted the need for self-quarantine. And like at least at the beginning of the, the pandemic, we've got a lot of broadcasts going out saying, oh, if you've traveled internationally, please be quarantined for the next 14 days. Or if you've come in contact with someone who has it, be in quarantine for the next 14 days and stuff like that. But at the same time, the, I think people are going to start taking for granted that 
other people know to quarantine and stop telling them, right? And I have encountered this week two people who have traveled internationally and who came back and who have not self-quarantined because nobody told them. And so maybe they were out traveling when everyone was kind of being informed of this. That's one possibility. So. Yeah, you know, I, I just realized that what I just said about that headline might have not seemed to make any logical sense. After the outbreak, quarantine in Italy is not self-quarantine, it's mandatory. But before the outbreak, the guy wouldn't have known that he was infected if he was patient zero. Right. So now either, like whatever time frame you're looking at, the headline was illogical. And, and of course, for those who have been living under a rock for the past week, Italy has been hit very hard with the coronavirus. And I think they're up to tens of thousands of cases and over a thousand deaths. And their emergency rooms and ICUs are utterly overwhelmed right now. They've been leaving older, like people older than 65, just outright to die and to uh, drown on their own. I think I have a, a quote here on my uh, Metaverse feed, uh, something along the lines of that they're, they've basically just given up on older people and are specifically trying to save the young in these emergency rooms and ICU units because Jesus Christ. the young people are savable. They can be saved. They're, the effort put into saving them is not very large per person and you can, the chance of survival is fairly good, but they have to be treated and they have to have access to things like breathing assisting uh, machines. Again, I don't know the, the technical aspects of the art of medicine enough to know the specifics here, but there's only so many doctors, nurses, beds, and uh, medical equipment to go around. And that has been saturated completely, in part because the people in Italy did not treat this seriously and did not close large venues. They didn't shut down their schools. They just let it continue to grow in its normal exponential speed of transmission. And the consequence was their ERs are now overwhelmed. And so that is the situation in Italy right now. The situation in China, my understanding is that they've got it under control, more or less. But of course, that has entailed like literally welding people into apartment buildings so that they wouldn't try to like go for groceries and stuff. Right, yeah. Uh, some of the advantages of a brutal communist dictatorship are that you can weld the citizenry into their apartment <laughs> buildings and stop a, stop a pandemic. The downside is pretty much everything else about life. Right, exactly. Like there's the one case, the, the one week in 100 years where you actually kind of need a little bit of government action to deal with a serious threat to your civilization, or at least to the lives of a lot of your people. And in that case, China's got that. Uh, they, they have the legal authority to deal with it. And I think we're seeing governments around the world, including here in Canada, start to clamp down on basic things like the freedom of association. Here in Saskatchewan, we just had uh, our government just outright forbid any group of more than 250 people from gathering, just done. That's not a legal thing here anymore, which, I'm sure we could take that to the Supreme Court if we had to, but the circumstances are a little bit special this week. <laughs> so Yeah, I mean, I really can't see the citizenry getting together and going, we want COVID-19, let us congregate. Well, uh, actually, it's, it's funny you mentioned that because I think on InfoWars right now, although it's hard to imagine how accurate this is, but they have something along those lines happening in, I think it's Kingston, Ontario, with a bunch of drunk <laughs> teenagers and university students basically having a big party going, we don't care if we get it, we're getting drunk. Oh, yeah. I mean, the, there was the pauser move, movement with HIV. I've already read a couple of, I don't know how well substantiated news items, but about people infecting other people on purpose and people not caring if they get it. Which, I mean, I, I can see that. There's going to be people out there like that. And um, I mean, people like to murder other people and uh, now they have a new weapon. And uh, I was actually talking with someone who may actually have it. I'm not going to give more specifics than that, but the conversation kind of went along the lines of like, there's a, a degree of power that you have in the, especially in an early on in the pandemic. And which again, that's another thing that's happened this week is the CDC and the WHO have called this a pandemic. It's a global pandemic event, the kind we have not seen in about a hundred years from, I mean, the, the last big one was probably the Spanish flu of 1918. But the, the idea that if you are just one person who has COVID-19 right now, and you want to have an impact in the world, you can by infecting just one other person. And you can cause the death of, who knows, maybe up to a million people just by intentionally infecting that one other person. 
And for some people, that's more power than they've ever held in their entire <laughs> life and possibly will ever hold again. It's, it's just like a, a very intoxicating thing to have that, that level of command over the rest of the world, right? Wow, we've we've actually found something even sadder than having a hundred thousand subs on Instagram. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, that, and and Holy that is going to be going through a lot of people's, or at least some people's mind. I'm I'm sure. And Instagram is another kind of interesting thing because my understanding is there was a a meme or something posted on Instagram that started the ball rolling on this toilet paper shortage that we're experiencing here in North America. And oh my God. Like, oh my God. Do people think they, I don't understand this at all. Do people think they can eat toilet paper? Why hoard toilet paper? Well, especially since it seems to be just toilet paper or like mostly toilet paper. Like I just went to yeah, the grocery I, store. I've seen people dragging carts around Los Angeles full of toilet paper and water. <laughs> like, A, you could always wipe your ass on a book. That's all you people seem to use them for these days anyway. Yeah. And and B, uh, I didn't realize that, you know, COVID-19 was about to evolve to the point where it has thumbs and it can bomb our water supply. Like, nobody told me the tap was going off. Exactly. Like, there's, I'm sure there are people that need to run the public water system on some level. Like, I, it probably mostly runs itself, but there's probably one or two people that sit in the control room or do something, right? Yeah, yeah well, you know what? Send the one or two people that get the mild cases of COVID-19. Right. Um, it's not a, a, actually a zombie apocalypse. Yeah, which I actually uh, just watched a zombie apocalypse movie last night because it's, <laughs> it's it seems like a very applicable set of, or genre to kind of watch in a, a week like this. Uh, with uh, well, Honestly, unless they're they like. I do not really envy our leaders having to run through the still and charybdis of A, an inappropriate response that doesn't take the disease seriously enough and doesn't get people to quarantine themselves voluntarily and then involuntarily if need be, and B, accentuating the danger to the point where you spark the easily panicked herd animals that we are into panic where we're actually making it worse. Right. Last night, downtown LA is not a ghost town by any means. There are people around, there are still homeless people stumbling up to you and breathing right on you. So I was, I had some work to do and I was going to go to Whole Foods and like buy, but you know, a pre package dinner and sit there and eat my dinner and work. And I got there and I had to leave because I knew I was going to be waiting in line at least an hour just to buy my prepackaged dinner because all the cartoon idea of people panicking is stupid fat people at Walmart in middle America panicking and buying toilet paper or at Costco. But these are moneyed people, well-dressed, at the fucking Whole Foods of all places, stripping the shelves of everything like a bunch of locusts, and then standing there in line a foot away from each other. When I think, <laughs> you know, I think the infection distance is like you're supposed to keep a meter or two meters between people. Yeah, to yeah it's, it's definitely like a little bit because my understanding is that it can survive in air. So like, especially yeah. if you've got someone coughing and getting like little water droplets suspended in the air for like a little bit, right? I mean, it's, it's not going to transport itself over long distances in the air, but it's not the sort of thing you'd want to be standing right next to someone who has it, even if there's no physical contact. Um, right. well, these, nobody wants to have somebody cut in line in front of them so that they can't buy their packaged turkey for the apocalypse. So they're all standing within a foot of each other, literally. Yeah. Marinating in each other's breath trying to avoid the apocalypse. And I'm just going, you know how you don't catch a virus? You don't go near other people and marinate in their mouth breathing. Exactly. So people are criticizing Trump and the government right now for not acting quickly and decisively enough. But And I don't think we have acted quickly and decisively enough. Yet at the same time, we have been decisive enough about the danger that we have more on stampeding and making it work. Right. So out of curiosity, like here, our university just closed. We have major like musical festivals have all gotten closed. Conferences, conference centers all closed. What is closing in the States? Have they started that sort of thing nearby you or is it out there in LA? And what what is kind of the response been? Well, 
Well, Europe is closed, which surprised me. I never thought I would hear an American president saying, yeah, no travel to or from Europe. That's strange. I just got back from Europe. I could have been stranded there if I'd well, not. You don't get stranded in Europe in the United States, especially if you're looking around at the ugly shit I'm looking at in L.A. right now. But that's right. the side. I'm just like I'm don't... imagining like the internment camp in France for American people stuck over there is probably nicer than the, the slums, you know. <laughs> It's probably nicer than nice lost apartments downtown in LA. Yeah, you get free healthcare and you know <laughs> things yeah. like that, right? Croissant every morning with your flu shot. Yeah, which is actually a, a, another a thing I kind of want to get to is the government. I think it was the government of Canada just suggested that all people who are Canadian who are vacationing outside of the country come back right now. And if, if you're outside of the country, come back so that you don't get stranded if the borders start closing to those countries, which right. to me is like the dumbest thing I've ever heard. It's like in a, <laughs> the case of a global pandemic, we want everyone from all around the world to immediately come to Canada. And, <laughs> right? Because we, we haven't got our R0 high enough. We need all of the cases we can possibly get within our borders <laughs> as soon as possible, right? Yeah, if you're quarantined on a ship right now, you'd better go home. Yeah, exactly. Get real. <laughs> I mean, granted, there are quarantine centers in Canada, like the military ran one a couple of weeks ago for people who came off of a plane where somebody was exposed. And uh, But just the number of people involved, like there, I think it, there was like 250,000 Canadians in what was it, Lebanon alone? Like, <laughs> this is not a small number of people who just got told to come to Canada from all over the place. Like, yeah, like maybe 100,000 in Hong Kong or something like that. It's a huge number. And most of them will not have as much of a, like they're living abroad. They're studying as students in foreign universities. They're trying to hook up and marry with people abroad. And there are tons of reasons why people are out there. But there's a lot of them out there. So it's, it's a very big move to uh, be suggesting that. Yeah, it strikes me as a little bit futile at this point to close borders because with the incubation period for this infection being what it is, uh, you could be closing infected cases into your borders and not even realize it. Like, it, yeah. it's a pandemic. You kind of do want to avoid Italy because it's kind of obvious there. And, of course, you don't want to go bat hunting in Wuhan anytime soon. But pretty much wherever you are, you're already fucked. Yeah, exactly. And, I mean, granted, that is going to be the difference between places with functioning healthcare systems and not, right? Where right now, the Canadian healthcare system, at least from what I can tell, is, is ready for something. The Saskatchewan Health District, uh, or the SHA, whatever the A stands for, has a bunch of notices. They're apparently preparing on the inside, although they're not talking about the details of what they're doing, which kind of suggests to me that they aren't that prepared. But they're doing something, at least at this point. But I can see a lot of panic. Americans, for example, if we have a functioning healthcare system and the American system is not functioning or vice versa, if the American system can put up with the load and there are beds available, we could see people from Canada being sent to the States, right? And that's where I think the contagion of like if 20,000 Americans show up in Saskatoon today needing health care, we're not ready for that, right? Or vice versa, right? Right. Well, this is part of how fast this has happened. And on one hand, some people are panicking and stockpiling fetish diapers and other shit they don't need. And on the other hand, a lot of especially really intelligent people or people who are really involved in things like this election or whatever they happen to be up to their elbows in a lot of people myself included are having a really hard time completely mentally switching over to how serious things are getting day by day and therefore i do not know how much to trust this information because i've heard that the united states is desperately short on ventilation equipment and like you said the exact kind of things that we need to save even young and healthy patients we don't have a lot of that but that could just be a false rumor that somebody started because they were still in the mentality of we have to somehow get crazy Uncle Joe to beat Trump in the election that's coming up because that's still important. So uh, right. let's make up some shit about how unprepared the Trump administration is. Could be true. Could be just somebody who is still thinking about the election and other shit that really isn't what they should be worried about right now when talking about healthcare matters. And that's kind of like a good point in that there's at this point so many things to worry about that it's kind of hard to stay focused <laughs> on like what 
what should be the thing we are doing right at this moment? Like just to give one example here, like the stock market crash and the corresponding <laughs> $1.5 trillion that the American Federal Reserve like just dropped into the market which disappeared and <laughs> had basically no effect. Yeah, I mean, we'll the, the crash. About, that about three months from now, when we finally, when it finally occurs to us. Oh yeah, <laughs> but like <laughs> the, it's immediately actionable for, and especially people listening. If if you're here and listening to this, you will never have a better time to buy stocks or to invest in things generally, especially things hit hard by this current panic, like hotel stocks. And again, I'm, I haven't really thought deeply enough into the the full consequences of who's being hit, but you can bet that hotel stocks right now are just getting hammered. And days like this, people panic, they sell their stocks. Assuming the stocks don't go bankrupt, like they'll probably still keep going down for a while. And it could keep going down for years even after this. But at some point, starting about this week, there are going to be hotels in the world. There are going to be hotels that make a lot of money. And regardless of which ones go bankrupt, some of them are going to survive. And whoever is investing right now is going to reap the dividends of that investment when it happens. Now, again, right. you got to be... I, I have some investment um, advice. I'm starting a new company and I'm offering shares publicly. I'm starting a company that creates hand sanitizer out of vodka and peanut butter because those are the only things that I could find at the Whole Foods last night. So, uh, if <laughs> so, so this is like double plus good here because we got the, it kills the people allergic to peanuts. But <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and if, if you start choking to death, you can use it as a painkiller. There we go. Yeah, I saw someone else post something. It was like hot sauce hand, san hand sanitizer. <laughs> So if you like use it and then rub your eyes, you'll immediately regret it. And so you stop touching your face, which is a big problem for some people like myself, because I like stroke my beard and like hold my head up with my hands all the time. So it's a very tough thing to not be like constantly touching or touching my face and then like touching other things and then having to wash everything and disinfectant everything. And it's a mess. Uh, yeah. I, you know, when I'm stressed as in, well, I've told you about Speaking of not knowing what to worry about, I've got a tenant, like a subletter to worry about. I've got, like, I, I need to find a place to live. I need to find a place to job. I've got all this other shit to worry about aside from the zombie apocalypse. And when I'm stressed, I do the same thing, except I actually will pick at my skin. They even have a psychological term for it called dermatillomania. I, I think I throw an extra syllable in there. But, like, any kind of little blackhead or blemish, I'll just pick at it. And obviously... That's a great way to get germs in your face. Oh, yeah. So, <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, somebody could make a lot of money selling me, like, mittens with knives in them. Or something. <laughs> <laughs> Some kind of training tool to keep me from uh, literally dying of a pimple. So, in the meanwhile, you mentioned when we were talking before we started here uh, that you had some kind of, like, tragic comic relief for the, the rest of us in uh, on some... What was the uh, tragic comic relief thing again? Oh, yeah. The Amber, yeah, um, whatever. Just as far as tragic comic relief mixed in with a little bit of celebrity gossip, I've been following what, what people have been calling and what I used to call the Amber Heard Johnny Depp saga because... I've known so many men who've been in Johnny Depp's shoes. One of them, Jim Goad, even went, wound up going to prison despite being basically a victim of domestic and partner abuse because men, even if they're literally being hit, really can't hit women back because then they'll wind up in prison. They'll wind up in jail. They'll wind up losing their career like, like Johnny Depp did when Amber Heard, um, no, she, she wanted attention or she wanted a good divorce settlement. So she was threatening him to make it public that he had been beating her and he was a violent alcoholic. And she did because apparently he didn't give her the penthouse she wanted or whatever. So okay. she, went to the Washington, she went to the Washington Post and they let her pen uh, some kind of bullshit infotainment about how she was an abused woman and she started speaking out for abused women's rights. Well, <laughs> Johnny Depp countersued her for, for slander and libel, I think, because as it's come out from recordings that were made while they were divorced, not only did he not hit her, she was repeatedly attacking him physically, sliced off his finger by hurling a vodka bottle at him. Holy uh, cow. And 
Yeah, and at the time, the press went along with her story. They were like, in one of his drunken rages against Amber Heard, Johnny Depp somehow sliced off his own finger. Like, how the fuck did that happen? You slice off your own finger while you're beating your wife? That is a very incompetent wife. Right. It turns out Amber it turns out Amber Heard is a much less incompetent wife beater, but we'll get to that. Like I saw an old, I had not been paying much attention to this because I was like, you know, I don't know the dude personally, but it just doesn't seem like this story adds up. So I'm, I'm just going to be quiet and see what happens. And sure enough, it comes out that not only is he innocent, she's the one who's her spouse, spousal abuser. And there's all these recordings about how she's yelling at him that he won't stay in fight with her and he's like well you know you're violent and i don't want to get violent with that because i know i'm going to wind up going to prison and she's taunting him and saying stuff like well i'm a 115 pound woman and nobody's ever going to believe that you were beaten up by me ha 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 so i can keep on beating you up and threatening you and like most deranged i guess you would call her a narcissist if you were a psychiatrist like most deranged narcissists she doesn't realize that other people aren't as stupid as she thinks they are. Right. And most people understand physics to a certain degree. Like, I don't understand the total ins and outs of, you know, particle and subatomic physics. You can calculate the probability that a particle exists or that's going to be here or there. I went to a really shitty school that didn't bother to teach me math. Like, they sent me home with an arithmetic textbook when they had me skip a grade because I could already read. So I don't have a perfect grasp of physics, but most of us understand the magic of projectiles. Right. And how a much smaller person can stand behind a, dr a door and throw a projectile at a larger person and injure them. Right. It's the basic principle of physics that projectiles are fucking magic. They can turn a smaller <laughs> person into a safe attacker. Right. So all of this has been coming out, and it's been kind of tragic comic relief because I don't mean to laugh at all the men that I know who have been through this, and I don't mean to laugh at Johnny Depp. I mean, he lost millions of dollars was publicly humiliated, had everyone turn on him, had to keep his mouth shut while this bitch is like on television doing her acting thing and talking about how she's and, and was she an guy. actor, like a professional actor or just oh, yeah, she was a professional actor. Okay. Actually she she had a big part in the first what do you call it, Aquaman movie with Jason Momoa from Game of Thrones. Okay. And made a shit ton of money doing that. There was actually when all this came out, there was a petition to get her kicked out of the second movie. And because she's a woman and feminists went apeshit or whatever, or the, the studios have no balls, they actually did not remove her from that project. Even though everybody immediately dropped Johnny Depp from projects at the- at So the, like his career is over sort of thing or, or momentarily yeah, over. His career was over, over an allegation that never held any water. There was never any proof for it. It's pretty much been proven up and down that she's a husband beater. And so I, I think you were talking about before we started that there were other men she was with that basically similar things happened to, or did I hear that right? Well, right. This is where it gets funny because I have been calling it the Amber Heard Johnny Depp saga, but then I realized it's actually kind of just the Amber Heard saga because as part of his libel suit, all these people are coming out of the woodwork that she's kicked the shit out of. And the really ironic thing is, especially since feminists have been defending her despite all the evidence, right. Amber Heard is bisexual, and she's been married to a woman before, and she beat the crap out of her wife, too. <laughs> and not only did she beat the crap out of her wife, but she tried to explain it by saying that the cop arresting them was homophobic. And what the cop had to say about that was, uh, I'm a lesbian. <laughs> <laughs> this, is, this just goes deeper and deeper. So yeah, it just, it, like the Amber Heard saga just gets deeper and deeper. So it, it, and then it turns out that I think right after she and Johnny Depp broke up, Amber Heard started dating Elon Musk, you know, the guy who shot a car in outer space. Yeah. Uh, so brilliant dude. Now photos are floating up of the two, of Amber Heard and Elon Musk showing up to the dress, and Elon Musk has a black eye. So is this, like, recent that he's now, Musk is now with this chick, or well, is it just, like, at the... He broke up with her, and he wouldn't really say why. He said, oh, my schedule's too busy, but then, like, yeah. <laughs> ten days later, he was dating someone else. Clearly, he was just sick of having shit thrown in his head. <laughs> I totally believe that. People are digging up all these photos of the two of them, like, and this is... While she's the spokesmodel for battered domestic partners and battered wives. Well, see, I think that actually makes a little bit of sense, that if she had gone through that at a period of her life, right, 
where she kind of normalizes that kind of relationship, right? Where if she gets used to that level of violence in her relationships, I could kind of understand that a little bit, but... I'm a domestic abuse victim. I mean, I'm the one who did the abusing and the violence, but it bothers me. So right. I'm on TV complaining about it now. But it, like I said, I don't mean to belittle or mock the suffering that people I know have gone through because women get away with domestic battering and nobody believes the dude. I don't mean to specifically mock Johnny Depp or Elon Musk or I forget the name of him. Amber Heard's battered ex-wife, but it's just like the hypocrisy and the fact that people believe her and the fact that feminists still believe her, even though she's a wife beater, she's literally a wife beater. Right. And, and, it, and it's, it's specifically uh, interesting to note, like usually when you have these abuse, uh, like the, the Harvey Weinstein case, which also like finished this, this week, uh, as I understand where like one of the things that happened in cases like his is you get the long trail of people that they abused before it went finally to court with someone who come out and say, oh yeah, he did this to me too, or he did this to the, the friend of mine or whatever, right? And in this case, if, if the long line of people are coming out saying that she's got this pattern of, of behavior there, then yeah, it's it becomes much more likely that it's a real thing, right? Yeah, and, and it just... Every detail I hear is more absurd than the last. Like, she's the spokeswoman for battered women as she's divorcing Johnny Depp. And the very next person she starts dating shows up with a black fucking eye. Like, she's yeah. still hitting people. So anyway, before, before we get too carried away here, I just want to remind my audience, and you are an author, and uh, I have been trying this past week to get a copy of your books, uh, or, or at least one of them, without success. So if you're interested in reading Anne Sturzinger's books uh, here in uh, Saskatchewan or Saskatoon specifically, you can contact ask us, A-S-K us at saskatoonlibrary.ca, I believe is the email address, or you can just get in touch with me and then we can like start uh, asking them as a group because that's the only way that we'll get the book here, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> but otherwise... Yeah, like I told you, I think, I think the library Googled me. Yeah. Pretty much. But oh, other she's, than that, she's though... not with Amber Heard? Oh my goodness, what a terrible person. Yeah. <laughs> and, but other than that, though, you have the new version of Nusquam coming out, apparently, right? Yes, yes. To be fair to the library, some of the difficulty might have something to do with the fact that due to a dispute between myself and my publisher over well, a large number of things, but mostly just basically the way publishing works nowadays, it's nothing really personal, but... It wound up with Nusquam, probably my best so far and the most well-loved novel being out of print. Uh, and the used copies are getting pretty expensive, I hear. So I am working with a third party to sort of straighten out the mangled file that was the result of, uh, well, people who don't do publishing, this will, this will mean nothing. But the people who do, uh, the, the file was edited in InDesign. So it's kind of a mess. Someone is kindly for a very low fee helping me straighten this out. And once I get rid of my sort of goth law subtenant and get a new place to live, etc., that new edition should be coming out within two weeks to a month. Oh, cool. As should my new long promised science fiction epic which was formerly called Life, but then uh, some stupid restaurant named itself that. So I changed the name to Electra's Revenge, uh, which I was going to publish as a series of novellas, but then I realized it doesn't really work as a series of novellas. So this is going to be the whole story, entire, long, satisfying story for one low price, and both of those should be out within a month, unless, and we were also talking about this before we started going on here, unless a peak in the, you know, amount of bullshit that happens in my day-to-day -day life gets in the way again. Like, your publisher gets the coronavirus and then becomes <laughs> missing in action, like, right before it goes to publish or that sort of thing, right? Yeah, and Amazon's like, Sam, did you Amber heard this guy? Uh, is he lying in, in a ditch somewhere? I'm like, I have no idea. I have, I'm not the coronavirus Exactly. And Amazon's like, ah, oh, yeah, right. You didn't infect those files with coronavirus on purpose. And I'm like, that's not how viruses work. That's a different kind of virus. Uh, snow crash. Don't you love Sorry. it? I'm, I'm really into doing lame, goofy-ass uh, 
comic routines today because uh, coronavirus. I'll just blame that because that seems to be what everyone is blaming for everything nowadays. So, yeah, you were kind of mentioning that on uh, Facebook, was it yesterday, that you, people are starting to blame like really weird things on the coronavirus. Do you have any examples of that? Or Well, well you know, to, to go back to the comic relief, Amber's like, well, I, I didn't mean to beat up my wife. I had coronavirus. <laughs> and it, it made me delirious. Oh, my goodness. Which actually, one of the real life examples of someone blaming something random on coronavirus was my scoff law subletter doesn't want to pay this bill that she's responsible for and doesn't want to pay that bill that she's responsible for. And it's like, well, you know, coronavirus, and it's like, but did the coronavirus go into your bank account and like, take the rent money? Which, I mean, I can kind of see that going forward. Like, there are countries like Italy, I think, is... Uh, made it so that mortgage payments and rent don't have to be paid for the next month or two or something. And I think France has done something kind of similar. And so like, there are definitely countries in the world where that's happening, but I've definitely also not heard of the United States being one of those countries. And I'm just not right. seeing I mean, the, the current U.S. The, the, government. As we were, you know, as we were discussing before, I keep I keep referring back to this conversation because it was so funny. I hate that when I have a conversation before we go on the air, and it's funnier than the shit that actually occurs to me while I'm on the air. <laughs> but uh, you were talking about how uh, hashtags that are trending on Twitter aren't necessarily legit. They aren't ne necessarily what's really being talked about. And I said a lot of people have trouble distinguishing between trending tags on Twitter and actual legislation. Like they think, oh, well, it trended on Twitter. It must be a law now. Right. And uh, the other day, it's some of Andrew Yang supporters were getting emergency UBI to trend. And I swear to God, there are 25-year-olds somewhere. <laughs> Sorry, I just walked through a, a forest of fucking skateboarders in California. <laughs> You're wondering what the hell that obnoxious racket and breathing virus on me was. Jesus. Anyway, oh, what was I saying? Oh yeah. There, the, oh yeah. The the, the idea that there are people who think that UBI is already a, a reality in the United States. Yeah, because it trended on Twitter. Like they're waiting for their check to come because well, it was a tr Twitter trend. All right, no, that's that's not how the U.S. Congress works, sweetheart. I mean, it sounds really condescending, but I actually talked to, I mean, this might be, uh, skipping topics again because I have unmedicated ADHD, this might be part of why Bernie Sanders is not beating senile Uncle Joe in the primaries. Right. His people Trump think that of all of his proposals have already passed, so we don't need and to, that, like, fix anything? Uh, could be part of that, but also, very concretely, and I'm not joking, this is a real thing, I was talking to a bunch of young Bernie supporters who were like, yeah, yeah, I'm totally for Bernie, I think he should be president, and... A few hours later, and this was in January, a few hours later they were like, so when's the inauguration? And I'm like, what? And they're like, well, January is the uh, inauguration, right? So we elected the new president. What? And I'm just like staring at them dumbfounded. You're really, really into Bernie Sanders and you really want him to win, but you think the election was this past November? Blink, blink. Yeah, I'm standing there. And th this was the same group of kids who I had asked, you're, you're for Bernie, so what do you think, how do you explain Stalin? And right. they go, who? Oh dear. Yeah. Like yeah a... That was another blink blink. And then this was like, wait, you thought the election was this year. Uh... Yeah, <laughs> so I... Who do you think is president, if I might ask? <laughs> <laughs> that is something. Anyway, so we are getting kind of close to the end of the show here. So if you have any last comments for the world out there now that you've got the world's attention well, well i just i just wanted to leave everyone with a comic visual but this will only work if you saw this meme in in chicago a few years ago there was a rapist who was kind of raping everybody in a particular neighborhood and a news organization interviewed this guy like the, the actual you know rapist. Him, you know him if you, you saw him. He's a black guy. He's wearing a red kerchief. It kind of looks like he just rolled out of bed. He really doesn't give a damn. He's not that excited about being interviewed. But he sort of iconically made this speech about how, like, you know, uh, lock up your wives, lock up your husbands, lock up your dogs, lock up everybody. You know, the rapist is coming. And when I started hearing about all the different genders and varieties of people that Amber Heard had kicked the shit out of, I couldn't help thinking about that guy running in front of her going, lock up your wives, lock up your husbands. All right. You know, the serial spouse beater is on her way. You know? Stuff to be worried yeah. about.
So in the meanwhile, thank you for those of you who have stayed throughout this show. And if you want more like this to come, especially as we get into some really bizarre times as the next couple of weeks are going to unveil some really bizarre events. If the last week was any indication, please consider going to my subscriber star, uh, subscriberstar.com slash Jeff dash Cliff, and maybe throwing a, a coin or two in my direction. Uh, I got hit really hard this week, so we'll, uh, we'll see how well funded I continue to be going forward. In the meanwhile, uh, also, please do, if you live in a place where you can acquire Anne Sturzinger's books, uh, go out and buy them and read them. And because it sounds like they're pretty good. Again, I haven't been able to get my hands on one yet, but please do go and do that. So with that, I'm going to leave you with the goodbye song, and then I will see you all next week. See you tomorrow. Yeah, that means you Always remember to be good and so...